All right, welcome to the Musicians Talk Show podcast, hey, hey, hey. episode 17. We made it 17 episodes, and if you're still with us, we are glad you are still with us. Uh, thanks for putting up with me and Matt and um, enjoying the incredible guests we have, man. And today is no different. We have Greg Howe. Um, I feel obligated to say he's one of my favorite guitar players and one of the reasons that I still play guitar today. Oh. Um, anything to add, Matt, before we get started Phenomenal here? player, great things to say all around, awesome human being, we love him. Yep, Greg's incredible, and I think you're going to really enjoy what he has to say. Um, let's, not, let's not talk about talking about Greg Howe anymore, let's just get right to it. Here we go. Get into it. So, I wanted to start at the tippity top. How'd you uh, get started in music? Wow, how did I get started in music? Um, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I honestly... For as long as I can remember, as far back as I can remember, uh, me and my brother, who's two years younger than me, we were always into music. We were always pretending to be the Beatles or, you know, grabbing <laughs> yeah. like tennis rackets and, you know, pretending to be on stage. And yeah. uh, we'd even write songs that, before we could play instruments. Um, and, you know, the, the whole concept of harmony and, and rhythm always just seemed like a very natural um, just a natural thing. So we, it was never really something that felt, it just felt very natural yeah. music. So I don't know that there was a, I don't know that I could identify a specific starting point, but as far as professional, really it was pretty much almost immediately after graduating high school, um, put a band together with my brother. And uh, uh, at the time I was living in, in uh, New Jersey. And so there was a local a friend of mine who played bass and we had found the drummer and we just, you know, immediately started doing, you know, putting songs together that were, you know, all guitar kind of rock metal guitar oriented yeah. type of stuff. You know, everything that was cool at that time, like yeah. Van Halen, Ozzy Osbourne, Randy Rhodes, uh, all the LA bands like Dokken and Ratten, you know, just anything that would give me an opportunity to, uh, you know, do my guitar thing. So, yep. yeah, that was early, early eighties. <laughs> and yeah. where did it go from there? <laughs> and then, uh, eventually after doing clubs for a few years, I had submitted a, a demo to Mike Barney's spotlight column. He had a column okay. in guitar play, player magazine called spotlight. And, uh, our band had, we had, uh, we had actually become popular enough on the, you know, in this sort of trice, County area, tri state area, and uh, uh, on the East Coast, you know, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York, that whole you know region, and we had uh, we had some management that set us up with some showcases, and we showcased for a bunch of major labels. We were actually under the wing of CBS Records for about we had a ninety day sort of uh, development deal with them came really close to getting a deal, but we weren't quite, we, I, we, you know, in retrospect, we weren't quite ready. Huh. And so we were just looking for a deal. I wasn't really trying to be uh, Mr. Guitar. I was just trying to uh, figure out a way that we could get a record deal. Yeah. <laughs> and so Mike Varney had this label called Shrapnel Records, and really? he had a, uh, a spotlight column that he would put out every month in Guitar Player magazine at the time. And so Spotlight was, was cool because it would feature three unknown guitarists every month, three people from around the world that were completely unknown. And uh, if Mike thought they were exceptional, he would feature them in the Spotlight column. If he, And if he thought they were super exceptional, he would offer them a record deal on his label. And at that time, uh, there was already... Uh, you know, Ingve had already been discovered uh, by Mike Barney. Uh, Tony McAlpine had already been discovered. Vinnie Moore had already been discovered. Paul Gilbert had already been discovered. And these are all my favorite and it guys. Was, <laughs> yeah, all all these guys that were really pushing the envelope at that time of of rock guitar, like really pushing the technique thing to new places. Um, and I was kind of the hotshot guitar player from my little area, but. I wasn't exposed to some of these guys. I knew of Ingve, and I was uh, blown away by him mm -hmm. and starting to get some of that stuff down underneath my fingers a little bit. And I felt like I, my thing was always, if I could, if I had this kind of technique, I would, 
uh, I would use it in a more bluesy way, I guess. I, you know, I was mm-hmm. never really a big neoclassical. I wasn't really right. a big fan yeah. of that type of music. Harmonic minor thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, so I started working on that and getting my stuff together. So I, when I submitted the, the demo finally to Mike Barney, I really wasn't expecting to get even featured because I figured, you know, there's got, there's, there's got to be so many guys out there that are just doing amazing things, which there are. But um, I guess, fortunately, he, he liked it. Uh, and I had actually FedExed my demo in addition to sending it to the um, P.O. box that he re- that he would advise people to send the demos to. I, I, I also decided to FedEx one directly to Guitar Player Magazine because my thought was somebody would have to physically sign for it and, yeah. and actually hold it in their hand. That's smart. And dilute. Yeah. yeah. And it really worked because <laughs> thinking ahead. That's awesome. <laughs> right. And it worked because uh, the very next day I got a phone call from Mike and he asked me uh, if I wanted to to do an album with him. So I was like blown away. Yeah. And and so. The deal uh, originally, he wanted me to do a four album deal with him, which was going to be all instrumental albums. And I said to him, I can't just abandon my band. I mean, these are these are my these are my boys. You know what I mean? This is yeah. we're like we're tight. We're a family. So we were able to negotiate a deal that gave me the ability to have two of two of the original four albums recorded with my rock band, which was, which we eventually called how to my, my brother. Yeah. So the first album I did was the first professional recording product that ever came out was just the Greg Howe album, self-titled album. Is that the, the one with kick it all over and all those? Yep. That's okay. exactly right. Uh, and then the second album was the how to album with the band and that that album okay. was called high gear right and and the third album was actually the, with the band as well because we we went on our second tour we did a u.s tour to follow up the first band release and it was a really great u.s tour um, very successful and then we had uh written a bunch of stuff for the second album so we decided to actually tour our way across the country record the second album in uh, Katati, you know, where, where Prairie Sun Studios outside of San Francisco is located and then tour our way back after the recording. It was really interesting, but that's exactly what we did. And that album came out. Um, it must have been 90, 91, maybe. Um, and yeah, that was the and, and that was that. So, you know, the fourth album, the fourth and final album of the original deal was the introspection album. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then I renegotiated uh, my contract with him. But anyway, that's that's the sort of long, boring version of how uh, the professional realm of my whole music thing started. Sure, sure. Okay, so um, you maybe, possibly more than other guitar players, are known for having a very, very unique voice on the instrument, and and it's even present. Of, in those first albums that you were just talking about, what led you to find that voice and, and how would you suggest others to do the same? Well, first of all, I have to say that that's like the biggest compliment I can get. And, and it's the thing that I've always wanted. And so it, it, it really makes me happy when I hear people say that because it's, oh, it's well-deserved. I mean, I can pick your yeah, playing I, out, out of a lineup every single time. And it's, and it's, right. it's fascinating to me that that's even possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. And I'm, and I really, I'm happy about that. Um, you know, I, it's a really good question. I, I think that the biggest barrier that a lot of players have is just the belief that, that their own uniqueness is actually cool. I can, I, because sometimes I see, and I can remember actually being young and thinking, you know, discovering little things on the guitar and thinking, this is pretty cool, but, um, why is nobody else doing this? If nobody else is doing this, maybe it's not cool. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Right. You know what I mean? Like you get into this weird uncharted territory sort of, kind of, yeah, you're right. And, and you start to, uh, it's strange. I got, you know, Van Halen was such a huge influence on me that, that there was almost a sense of, uh, almost this weird sense of guilt when I started to feel myself moving past the, some of the things that I had learned from him you know, and right. going, be, going beyond that. 
and you're kind of like, wow, this is weird. You know, Eddie's my idol. It's sort of like, you know, the day you realize you could, you could beat up your dad or something. You don't like it. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know, you, you don't want that. You want to still be able to. Um, but I think it was through that process that I started to really recognize that it's not really, you know, my favorite guitar players are not the guys who are necessarily the greatest, but they are the people that have the most prominent, unique yeah. voices. Yeah, same. Um, and that really is, has always been the case with me. I, I mean, I could name, I, I could point out, at least on YouTube, tons of guitars who, uh, whose technique and abilities are just, you know, mind-boggling beyond my, my abilities. Yeah. But, but often, in my opinion, it, it lacks what you just talked about. You know, like, for instance, you know, Christopher Walken is an example I use a lot as a, an actor. He's one of my favorite actors. Um, is he great? I'm not even sure. I just know that there's nowhere I can get that right. other than right from him. Right. There yeah. is no that's other a good point. place. Yeah, that's a great that. way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. That's probably why he's one of the most impersonated, you know, is like Absolutely. so unique. Yeah. So unique. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So I feel the same way about guitar. When I think about my favorite guitarists, it's, it's guys like, you know, like Hendrix and Van Halen and Larry Carlton and Robin Ford and Alan Holdsworth and uh, John Schofield. All of these guys are the same thing. I could pick every one of them out of the lineup. It would not take more than two seconds. Three notes is all I would need to hear yep. to be able to identify any one of them. And so how do you do that? I think you do it by... Um, I don't know. I don't know that, that everyone... I don't know that everyone can do it, but I, I would think that if someone's... If, if a person's really open enough about themselves if, they, if this person's honest enough and if a person is brave enough they can start to listen to themselves from an objective place and they can hear whatever unique qualities there are about them right. but the, the trick is the trick is not to just look for unique qualities the trick is to embrace them yeah i mean and i say this a lot i, I did a whole clinic tour based on what i'm about to say which is that so many of the unique things that I do on the guitar, things that 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 people I see people talk about on the internet, and they go, oh, there's a Greg Howell thing, and here's another Greg Howell. So many of these things were not the result of trying to be unique. They were the actually the as, as opposite. It was the result of being unable or unsuccessful at a conventional way of trying to do something right. that I would, and then having to figure out some workaround, some alternative method of getting that same type of thing. It's just true innovation. Yeah. Is what it sounds like. Right. Yeah. With that, right. Cause I think true innovation happens when you're, when you're not looking to be innovative, you're right. looking for solutions. You're looking for solutions. You know? Exactly. You're solving right. your own problem. Right. Exactly. So I, I really, uh, I focused a lot on, on when I'm talking about this stuff in clinics, especially, uh, and I say to people, embrace your weaknesses, you know, recognize them and, and they may be a blessing because they may be the doorway into a discovery about some new way of doing something, but you got to embrace it. Don't necessarily get down because something seems, you know, if you're, you're not good at sweet picking and you've, you've practiced it, you know, four hours a day for four months and it doesn't seem to be improving. Well, maybe there's a message in there and the message is uh, there's poss possibly there's a whole nother approach that you can have to achieve the same type of thing that you're trying to get from learning this technique and maybe right. there's a better way for you to do it. Right. That's just a, a sort of super, uh, superficial almost kind of, well, you know, yeah. It, it, yeah, you know what I mean, but it's, so, it's so the concept. Yeah, so if you hear something in your head and you're hearing this sweet picking sound, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to play it exactly like, you know, some other guy plays his sweet picks or anything like that. I mean, just you getting that sound in your head and trying to get to that right. on the guitar will lead you to but your own path. That's exactly right. You know, if I, if, if in my mind I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, I, you know, because what I used to do and I still do it to this day is if I, I improvise in my mind all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I remember being a kid and living in an apartment with my ex-girlfriend and she'd go to work and I was the typical musician that was sort of just riding on her, <laughs> <laughs> her, like uh, taking care of me. Right. <laughs> right. But, you know, I'd be like, I'd be doing the dishes or vacuuming. I'd have the music on or have my headphones on and I'd be singing guitar solos uh, in my mind and sometimes out loud, you know, just the, what I thought would be the perfect guitar solo for this section of a song. And what I would notice after a while is that certain themes would, would recur. Reoccur. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then I would say to myself, okay, well, that, that if I keep hearing this, uh, then I should probably go figure out what it is so that the next time I hear it, I actually can play it. I can actually have access to that thing. So if I were to hear in my mind something that that's got a really straight linear, you know, something that you would get from sweet picking yeah. or something that sweet picking would lend itself to. Um, I may uh, not, I may try to do it that way and go, wow, man, this is really difficult. And then, you know, inadvertently discover something else, maybe string skipping, you know, string skipping right. is you, you listen to Paul Gilbert and he's great at, as sort of not doing, he's great at uh, having an alternative version to right. To sweet picking, you know, and getting the same kind of effect. So I just, you know, I think it's just uh, having as much fun with it, you know, embracing your own strengths and weaknesses and figuring out a way that a style can be, you know, be feeling good about certain weaknesses in the knowledge, in the knowing that these weaknesses may be preventing you from just be, being another generic shredder, yeah. you know, maybe, right. maybe, you know, so I don't know if that answers the question well, but totally absolutely. Does, absolutely. Uh, I think one of the things that makes most guitar players unique is, or at least able to pick them out of a lineup, like we keep saying, is vibrato. And you have, yes, um, I'm, I hesitate to say the word developed, but you use a very unique form of vibrato that's kind of glissando, kind of violin yep. based. Um, where did that come from? Man, that's so. That's another good question. That I, I honestly, I think started on my very first album. If you notice, I don't listen to the first album much, even. I like the tunes on there. The mix is so it's so bad. It's hard to listen to it. It's an old. It's an old. Uh, you know. It's a first album. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, the music is ridiculous, and you're you're absolutely right. Kick it all over. I mean, that the the main melody there, and what I would call the chorus, is it's got that vibrato all over it. Yeah, and um, I was recording with Mike. The way that Mike does these recordings, at least back then, was very sort of um, almost assembly line based. It basically, basic tracks are first you know, get the drums and bass down. Then, you know, we'll spend a day doing just rhythm guitars. Then we'll spend a day just doing all the melodies. And then the final day would always be the improvised sections, you know? And so when it came to the, the, the solo, the, you know, the final thing, um, it was a strange situation back then. Mike would be sitting, basically sitting right in front of me, facing me and uh, controlling the, the tape, you know, cause it was two inch tape back then. And, uh, I just be playing and it was a little scary. I had to be honest with you. Cause when you're sitting in front of Mike Barney and you're remembering like, okay, so this guy has been, this guy has sat right in front of all these amazing guys. You know, he's heard, he's watched Paul Gilbert and, and, uh, you know, Ingve and, and Tony and, and Vinny and all, you know, he's seen them all. And now here I am, I'm sitting here. It's like, I'm playing in front of all those guys. Yeah. Um, and then he would say, okay, here's the solo section, go. And I'd just start playing. And uh, and a lot of times he would just stop the recording machine and says, yeah, I uh, wasn't crazy about that. Let's try something else. Um, there was one uh, instance where I played a run or I played a phrase. I don't remember exactly what I played, but I ended it with this vibrato. And uh, he sort of stopped the machine and he says, I, I, I like that. I like that a lot, but um, I'd like to get a really exaggerated vibrato in that. Can we punch the last note in? And I'm like, okay. So we punch it in and I try to, you know, increase the vibrato and, and but somehow it just didn't feel right. And I had thought back about like an old, I think it was actually George Lynch, some MTV video where, he kind of used to do that, but it was not, not so much for the sound of vibrato, more for just like the effect right. of just some crazy thing happening on yeah. a guitar. Yeah. Um, but I had already been sort of honing in on that a little bit, and I, I liked the idea that I could sort of make it sound like vibrato. So we punch in this last note, and I do that, and Mike looks at me like, oh, yeah, that was it. What'd you do? That was great. What is it? And uh, I liked it, and I figured, well, you know, this is cool. Yeah. If this is, if this sounds good once, uh, why wouldn't it sound good? You know, 875,000 other times. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good rule to live by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you, you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned the mix and how you're kind of unhappy with the mix on the first stuff. And then thinking about wheelhouse, which I want to talk about later, which sounds oh, phenomenal. Um, Thank you. Are there any plans? Maybe. 
I think the fans would really like to hear some of the the earlier stuff re-recorded with um all the new stuff re-recorded. That you do. That's that's interesting. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I if they would want to hear that, I would love to. I mean, I my style because I my, absolutely you know, agree with what you said, which the music is outstanding, but the mix. You know, leave yeah, something to be desired. Sure. It's a, it's an older mix. Isn't yeah, it? absolutely. And and you were an, a new guitar player at the time on the scene. I mean, hearing those right. tunes. Um, I mean, not not reimagined necessarily, and and not necessarily note for note, but hearing those again with more modern uh, production techniques would be just. I mean, yeah, amazing. Be more modern production, more modern production techniques, and a more and you know, and obviously, obviously, with whatever. Uh, yeah, and and with the version of me that has evolved since then. absolutely right. i mean right. you've been sitting on these right. songs what year did the first album come out 88 88 so you've been singing on these songs for that long and you've been playing them <laughs> exactly. god knows how many yeah. times yeah. i mean how have they evolved you know i think that would be a, a really oh. cool thing to hear well that's something to really think about i never i've actually never thought about that and the nice thing about that is that i then i could i would own the masters for the new version because right. <laughs> right now the label the there label uh, owns the masters um, yeah, which means that your music I'll only take right. 20, 25 percent, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? You're very generous. Thank you. I no, for real though. I think that would be a that that would be spectacular Super to hear that stuff. Yeah. You know, now with with it would, it with would sounding like Wheelhouse, that would be insane. Oh yeah, and and it would. I think people would really dig it because um, absolutely. The one thing about the first album that I do really like is the fact that the songs, the songs are have real catchy melodies you know they're real kind of hooky you know they're yeah i that was the first time i'd ever written instrumental stuff so i was mm-hmm. really in a vocal yeah mindset yeah. you know um and when i when when i do get brave enough to go listen to some of that stuff on the first album it's i'm sometimes reminded like wow you know these are just kind of cool songs they're just you know they're almost satriani esque not not like yeah. his songs yeah. but but the same approach in that they're they're easy to digest yeah you don't yeah. have to be a yeah well i mean who, who doesn't want to hear the the chorus section of kick it all over with all that tapping right or, or you know yeah, even yeah. even bad racket which is just right is so insanely rocking like it's just yeah i mean well thank you hearing that again would in in a new sense would be incredible and and speaking of wheelhouse i would love it if you could kind of take us through the recording process and i'm i'm believe I've heard you had a lot to do with the mixing or maybe mix it all yourself or something like that. Could you take us through the process of, of making wheelhouse, which is a great record, by the way. I love it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Wheelhouse was a interesting record because um, I had tried to, um, I was trying to get vocal things going. I'm sure you know that the Marigold thing, um, I, I, you know, I love the way the Marigold album came out, but we, we really couldn't work as a band. We just did not, there just wasn't a compatible camaraderie with the band. Right. Uh, and eventually it, we, we just had to, you know, we had to call it quits, but, but that I think the, album the first really album nice. was great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I thought so too. And so, but I was really in vocal mode. So I had a couple of attempts with other singers uh, after that and really spent like almost a whole year trying to get something going with a vocalist. Sure. Were you working with uh, Michael Graham at some point? I was working with Michael. I think Burton. I saw that on yeah. either your or his Instagram and, and he's a great singer as well. He's an amazing singer. I only I knew mean, him he's... from his solo album. And then my girlfriend told me he, he won or almost won the voice or something like that. And I was like, Whoa, didn't know yeah, that. He, no, he did win. <laughs> yeah. He won. He won the whole thing. I didn't know that at all. Um, I just knew him from his, his album that I'd heard, which I loved. Yeah. It's just great. And you know, it ended, turned out he lived in Vegas and it turned out he lived right down the street, literally walking distance from where I am. That's crazy. And so we started, we became good friends. He's a great guy, you know? Um, but again, there were issues that, that uh, in more in, in the administrative areas that weren't going to work because of his management versus my management. And it just becomes very confusing and things have to really be right. Yeah. Um, if you're going to, yeah, you know, get in bed with someone like that, you know, really, yeah. if you're really going to have a relationship startup, it, it, Things it's, have to be ironed out. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that, that so many other factors can come into play that have oh, nothing to do with the music. Oh yeah. And I've seen, and I've seen them ruin the music or oh. ruin the, the situations because they weren't addressed correctly up front. Um, so I really wanted to avoid that. And we just couldn't come again. We couldn't really come to terms with how we would move forward professionally or contractually. So, you know, we just parted ways um, on good you know, everything was good. 
and who knows someday we may do something, but, um, finally I was like, man, I, I gotta do something. <laughs> I've been, you know, uh, I've been trying to make this vocal thing happen for whatever reason. It doesn't seem to be in the stars. Um, I, I've got a lot of material written. Some of the stuff that you would hear off wheelhouse, like say throw down and, uh, let it slip. Those songs are actually written for the second, uh, Marigold album. That's interesting. And, huh? Yeah. And there was, uh, you know, Shady Lane is on there. That would have been a, a cool one as well. Were the melodies um, something Megan would have sang, or were they just something that you came up with after? The melodies would have been different than. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. A, a lot of times, uh, vocal melodies don't translate. Uh, yeah. Great to guitar, <laughs> or or vice versa. Yeah. You sing a wide um, intervallic tapping lick. <laughs> right. That <laughs> <laughs> might be challenging. Right. Yeah. So eventually, um, I just started. Uh, you know, digging through the archives, I have a lot of material that, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that hasn't made previous albums. Uh, there were some new ideas that I had. There were some, I was just taking stuff from anywhere. I could get it. There were some ideas that I was writing for Michael Grimm. There was some instrumental ideas. It was a song that I wrote during a clinic at MI. The third song on the album is a song called, or fourth, is it third or fourth? The fourth song, I think is called Landslide. And it's kind of a prog rocky kind of song. Um, I literally wrote that while I was recording with Simon Phillips last year in February in the middle of a recording session. I remembered I have a clinic tomorrow at MI and I was completely unprepared. I had nothing prepared whatsoever. So uh, I get down there and Gianluca Palmieri, the drummer who I've worked with a lot, he works at MI and I was able to get him to play with me. Oh, and I was also able to get John Richard who played bass on the soundproof album. And I said, can you guys, I don't have any backing tracks. I don't have anything. You know, I've got nothing but my guitar. <laughs> so can you guys at least back me up in this way? You know, if nothing else, we can just jam out and then I'll answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, That'd be and then on the way, <laughs> yeah, that could have been cool. And then as on my way there, I was thinking, you know, I actually do need another song or two for, for my album. Maybe I'll write a song because, you know, when I do a lot of these webcam lessons, one of the big questions I, I get from from guys who are aspiring artists is, you know, what's the writing process? How do you write these songs? How do you go about it? How do you get this information to other people? Do you write it down? Uh, you know, so I thought maybe it would be a good seminar to have uh, people just watch me write a song. Um, that's a really and, great idea. And that's exactly yeah, it was cool. A lot of people liked it. There was a lot of people that didn't really like it. They were kind of like, what are they doing? You know, and or they didn't believe it. They they thought, oh, right. Just like bullshit a prepared or something. That would probably be harder yeah. than just doing it. I think it would be hard. Like, no, it, it, yeah, it was like a real, acting. real. Yeah. Right. Preparing. No, it was it. very genuine. Of course. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So we so that was a song that, that came about from the clinic. And I even thanked uh, M.I students on the album oh cool because there were there was some input there was a guy that had raised his hand and said uh, you know because i played like one section and said what are you guys hearing what do you anybody have any suggestions and somebody said could you do like a whole tone thing blah 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 so when you of hear course. that lick that goes <laughs> right and then you hear a so the opening lick that that sort of uh leads up to that main riff every time is a whole tone Thing. And that came from one of the students. Nice. Um, so anyway, um, the process was finding free time. You know, the other thing is I had just gotten off tour with Stu Ham, and I was I was right back in the the uh, studio with with Simon Phillips, and simultaneously trying to do my album. Uh, so I had a lot of music pumping through my brain, but um, I, the the real goal was to get it all organized enough to, to get the album out. And, and the thing is I had a tour scheduled for uh, August and I knew that not only did I have to get my uh, album finished, I had to have it released or at least available by August 1st. And so honestly, it really became a situation where I was just in my studio pretty much every day, you know, getting up early, going to bed at four every morning, uh, and just cramming yeah, the stuff down with, yeah, really grinding it out. And, um, 
it's hard to, to specifically tell you what the process was because it's it, there isn't one. You know, it, it's it's you, you you take whatever you can get wherever you can get it from, right, and, right. You, and then you you run in the studio and just <laughs> find the find the time to put it down whenever you can. Yeah. And you did all the mixing on this one. Um, I didn't do all the mixing. No, I had I had a guy. Uh, his name is Sean. Oh, hold on a second. What's his last name? McGee. Oh yeah, Sean McGee, um, who's done a. Uh, I, I I don't. Yeah, I have to look at his bio, but I think he's worked with um, some pretty notable bands and very good engineer. Um, so he came to my house and mixed a lot of the stuff. When, when I recorded the drums originally, I recorded in a, all, I don't have a live room at my house. I used to, when I was back on the East coast, but I don't have a live room. So when I, in the, if I record drums, I have to go somewhere else. Right. And, uh, the guy that did most of the drums on the album is a guy named Pepe Jimenez. Who's, who's a local Las Vegas guy, uh, amazing drummer. And he had played with, he had actually replaced the Dennis chambers when Dennis left. Santana. Um, and he often plays with this guy, Rashawn uh, Westmoreland, who ended up playing the majority of bass on the album. And I figured those two together would be cool because they play together a lot. It'll be a tight rhythm section. Right. And it, re and it really was cool. Um, we ended up tracking the drums at Pepe's house. And I'm telling you, it was a matter of, I, I put a song together. I put the sequence together. Um, I basically created a demo, you know, Right. So what they get is my sequence drums, my bass playing, my guitar playing. Okay. So you get like a full fleshed out demo. Yeah. Your idea. Yeah. Full fleshed demo. And here you guys listen to this, you know, feel free to, you know, enhance it in any way you feel, you know, it fits, you know, it needs yeah. it and yeah, as long the music. within reason. Yeah. Yeah. It serves it. Exactly. And man, then it would be like, okay, so. I'll be, I'll come over. We'll track these two or three songs Friday. Okay, great. I come over Friday and I'm telling you, it was like one take with these guys. Wow. And they were, tra and they tracked at the same time. That's so interesting. Never, we, yeah. The drums and bass would track at the same time. I guess that makes a lot of sense, but that's something that I guess you don't hear about too much. It's either yeah. all live or, you know, piece by piece. Right. Right. And it's, it's just, there's something about it that feels so, like really, I, you know, I'm just live. Like, could it really be that easy? Is it done? No, <laughs> of course not. We gotta, we gotta do a second and third, and we gotta. It can't be, you know. And then I'd get the tracks home, line them up, and it was like, man, the tone, the tones are great, the playing is great. Um, so they really helped make it easy. And and to be honest with you, this is reminding me, um, the session. The, re the the original recording session that I did with Pepe and West and and uh, Rashawn was actually scheduled to be with Michael Grimm. So Michael Grimm and I had already set up this recording session that was going to where we were going to start tracking, um, and it was in between the the sort of setting up of that, you know, the scheduling of that session and the session itself that we were that we decided that we were unable to come to terms with you know, contractually how we would do this. So okay. I, that's when I was said to myself, well, I don't care what happens. I'm putting out a product this year. So I'm going to go to the recording session by myself and <laughs> something's going to happen. That's what that's, you know. <laughs> determination. Yeah. 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 I just kind of jumped in and, and just said, yeah, here's a track. There were some things I gave these guys to learn where I didn't even have melodies or anything written for them. I just, you know, like Throwdown was a song written really for Marigold. And uh, I, I, I couldn't even envision how I was going to translate that into a, an instrumental song, but I just figured let's track it. And then I'll, once I have it in my studio, I, I can play around with it. And it was actually a lot of fun. I, I, one of the things that was cool about, about this album is that because some of the material was written for vocals, it makes for a different type of instrumental song. Right. So, um, a lot of times when I hear instrumental albums, particularly guitar instrumental albums, they kind of they kind of have this theme, this sort of uh, format that's that's cool, but kind of predictable. Where you know, 
you know it's it, you know you, you you know it's an instrumental song no there's no question about it it's 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 you know it, it sounds like it's designed to be instrumental whereas if you hear you know if you hear a, like a riff like that right you're you almost easily, expecting that voice to come in right you're almost expecting a voice and then when when the voice ends up being a guitar then i th- i think that can be kind of unique yeah um so i had fun with it it was actually uh, i was it shows a little yeah i was a little hesitant because i didn't feel it wasn't like the same feeling that i've had in the past with albums like the five album or parallax where it's like okay this album's done i feel good about it this every you know this is great i kind of felt almost like I hope people like this because this really feels like I'm just kind of putting it out there because I need to put it out there. Even though I don't really do that. I, I, I can't actually, I can't release something that I don't feel good about, yeah. but I, I just never had that secure super feeling of, wow, people are really going to dig this. So I was so elated and, and blown away when, um, when it was released and it was received so well. I mean, all the reviews were amazing. Everybody I talked to on tour who had it loved it. And I was just like, wow, I didn't expect that. I honestly didn't. I thought it was going to be sort of yeah. like, cool, album, cool album, Greg, you know, pretty <laughs> maybe, cool. maybe that's, um, a healthy <laughs> level of anxiety is, yeah, nervous is good. Is, yeah. I think so. Yeah. It edgy. I think sometimes it's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So what does your uh, home studio look like nowadays? Oh, it's very minimal. Um, everything is, uh, so I use Pro Tools. Okay. And what else? I'm using the uh, the Universal Audio interface. One of the um, twins or a, a bigger one? Uh, I'm I'm about to get the bigger one. I wanted to uh, experiment with the small one, so it's the twin thing yep. first. Yep. But uh, they're pretty affordable and they sound amazing. That's amazing. what I've heard. Yeah, I'm, I use all Focusrite stuff, but I've heard great stuff about the Apollos. And, and I have I have uh, the Focusrite. Uh, interfaces with 16 input one and that does sound great but i will say that uh i think the universal audio the other thing that's nice about it is all the onboard effects all the onboard right. stuff so that's really the the thrill of it because it takes all this stuff off your processor you don't you, know, sure, you can get yeah. some great reverbs and um but that's about it. Yeah, I'm using that. I've just what, what does my studio look like? It's just it's it's a room. It's a it's like a bedroom uh, right. that, that's turned into a studio. Like I said, I don't have a live room, so it's it's really just my my yeah. studio desk. Do you record um, out, of, out of your out right out of your amp, or do you record direct in through anything? Well, that's a, that's a good question as well. So for a long time, I was recording with a live cabinet in another room mm-hmm. and it's it's a pain in the ass yeah. because it means that yeah, i've got cables going through sure. the house yeah. well we're here right. proponents of the kemper so okay great yeah well if you like the kemper i think you're going to like this, this whole thing that's now happening with these um impulse response files mm-hmm. because emulating cabs and I, such oh man i tell you it, it not it's only real. and you have to understand i'm kind of a I'm kind of a tube amp snob, so I have sure, absolutely. I, I have played with I have played with the Kemper. I have played with the Axe FX. I've played with all the amp modeling stuff, and and I'll be the first to say that all of it gets closer and closer all the time. And some of it's really amazing, but they still, for me, all of them lack. There's a nuance that I cannot identify, except other other than by feel. There's a nuance. In a, in a real tube amp that's different still than what I get out of any of those other yeah, things. Yeah, I agree. Some, some, feel some sort of X factor, you know? Yeah, it's an X factor. But that thing is, but so I was very hesitant about the, uh, the impulse response files. I just thought, well, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be cool. Simulated cabinets, simulated mics, simulated, you know, recording scenarios uh, right. you know maybe this could be fun I, but you still know, using I doubt, the head you know and love right but still using the head so i but so I, you can imagine i was pretty skeptical i'm i'm not i'm the i'm the guy that's man it takes a lot to to, to make me say wow i like this new product like it, <laughs> because i really am old school and tube amps really are i'm not snobby i mean 
I would love it if somebody comes out with an amp that's the size of an overdrive pedal and is all solid state and sounds amazing and <laughs> feels amazing. Yeah. I'll be the first one to play that thing. But thus far, yeah. I haven't I haven't found that. Right. So when I so I picked up the Sur thing, the uh reactive load, and then tried it. I gra- gra- grabbed some stuff from two notes and from own hammer and started playing around and I'm like, wow, this actually sounds and feels like a mic cabinet. This is amazing. Um, and in, in many instances, it sounded a lot better than an actual cabinet that I would have mic in a closet here at the house. Right. Um, it's sometimes way better. Yeah. More consistent. Probably, you know, setup doesn't change. Setup doesn't change. Um, you can, you know, simulate moving the mic to different places. You can add another cabinet. Um, you can close mic and, and, you know, have a sort of a room mic. You can, there are so many different ways. In other words, I, I was able to hear all these different, all my amps in contexts that I had never heard them in before. Yeah. I was like, wow, I didn't know my Fender dual showman sounded like that through a, you know, through an open back two twelve cabinet. Right. Wow. That's right. amazing. With a click of a button. Uh, Right. With a click of a button. So I really got into that. Yeah. It's kind of like, it seems like that is kind of a, a halfway between digital. It and is log. for guys like me who, who just cannot, who just have a trouble with anything that isn't really just a tube amp. Yeah. Um, but want the convenience of all these cool things that are coming out, like, like, like the X effects and the Kemper and all that. Um, it's, it's ideal because now it's just like, yeah, I, it, it's very simple. I just have my amp sitting on it. I have sort of a, a shelf full of a bunch of amps. And then I can just run the output to, I run it to like a DBX EQ that I have that I, I, I roll off a couple of frequencies. But for the most part, it's usually pretty straight. And then I'll go right into the interface from there. And um, and it's that simple. Yeah. Once I, once I, once I open up the, the session, I, I can just start moving virtual cabinets around. So I was, I had a lot of fun with that and I was really blown away by how they responded and how they acted. And of course it was convenient for my fiance who no longer had to listen to a, yeah. a loud ass cabinet in the corner of the house. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every time you play guitar, which is, I assume all the time, <laughs> which is all as yeah. And whenever I can, exactly. Nice. Okay. So, um, do you have favorite, music now that has been out in let's say the past two years who are some of your favorite bands favorite guitarists favorite um anyone really anyone getting excited yeah wow man you guys are asking the tough good tough (laughs) questions um i don't know if i have that uh now i mean i listen to everything and the, the the funny thing about me and my music collection is that you know I think that often people think that if they were to get into my car and look at my CDs or something, they would find a lot of like best of Coltrane, you know, dream theater, uh, you know, Herbie Hancock, you know, all these, this high level music. Mm-hmm. Um, and often it's like, you know, Madonna's greatest hits, you know, <laughs> um, good music, John Mayer, you know, live at something. Gotta or, love John Mayer. Uh, yeah, gotta love it. I mean, I really do like. I, I, there's a lot of guilty pleasure music that I like, and I really, because of the fact that a lot of the music I play is kind of advanced. I mean, compared to typical music, typical stuff you hear on the radio, mm-hmm. I like bringing the hook element to that. So I, I I listen to a lot of pop. Believe it or not, I listen to a lot of pop music. Yeah. Um. You know, Maroon Five. You know, I yeah. listen to. Uh, just, just anything that's got a hooky thing to it, because then when I get into my stuff and I'm getting into odd times and, and weird chords and, and all this stuff, there's a component within all that. I think that that's still like a catchy, grabby. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's yeah. that, there's a hook factor still in there because, you know, I'm, I'm no different than a listener. I want sure. to like a song. Sure. I, I want to, uh, I want to latch onto a melody and hear something that that's got a hypnotic appeal to it. So um, it's not very difficult. I, you know, when, when I hear guys say things sometimes to me, like doesn't it ever push you off when you hear all, you know, Justin Bieber and, and, you, and then you guys like you are making all this amazing music. And then 
uh, these guys on the radio or bullshit. And it's like, no, it doesn't really, because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very close minded, small minded way of thinking. I think it could be because the, the, the thing is in, in many ways, when you have free reign to do whatever you want, you know, and a guitar instrumental album and on a label like shrapnel, or when you don't have a label at all and nobody telling you what to do, are you, there's no boundaries, you know, and that's great, but that's, but it's very easy to be creative with no boundaries. I, I think it's a much tougher thing to do to hear a song. When I hear a new hit song come out, even if I don't like it, I can respect a great song, even if I don't enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I can say to myself, how is it that these guys came up with a brand new way yeah. of making the same four chords work with a melody? Like, yeah, how I, in a certain way to, to, to be really new and fresh and at the same time have this heavy dose of familiarity, uh, but yet be new. And, and it, that to me is that, you know, to work within those confines, I think is, yeah, is sometimes very tight much confines. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, very, very tight. And I think it's a great exercise to try to think, can I, I think a really good exercise if I was teaching a songwriting class would be, I want you to write something that sounds generic and I want it to not be generic. I want yeah. it to be something new and I want it, I want you to work on making it sound like something that everybody believes they've heard before. Yeah. Um, that's a great exercise because it's uh, because then you're getting into territory that's that's going to pay off because it's going to be catchy. It's not difficult to just write crazy stuff. I mean, just you know what I mean. Let your imagination, I don't, yeah, run wild. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let your, <laughs> I don't find that to be super challenging. I find it much more challenging to be to be creative. A little bit boxed in, right? Do you boxed ever in. do you ever kind of create your own boxes to help you be more creative? Um, when in the songwriting process, for sometimes, example, sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes I will, sometimes I will, I will say to myself, uh, things like, you know, the main melody, I want the main melody to be something that is really, you know, real catchy and people have to sing, you want to sing along with it. So this eliminates any chance of odd time being here or any, uh, sort of crazy modulations right. or odd chords. Uh, I've got to keep this. Within the parameters, uh, this is going to be, yeah, yeah, right. And so now, now, what the only thing that's going to make it unique is the fact that it's a guitar doing the melody, and that the melody is going to have to be a brand new melody that's never existed before, right? And so maybe, that's the challenge. Yeah, maybe like a unique tone, different guitar tone, or something, and then that you know that's that true. all just takes it to a different level. And even though you're doing the same four chords, exactly, right, exactly. And so actually, what, think, what comes to mind when thinking about that is that um, I guess the lead single off the Marigold album, "Evergreen Is Golder." That one really mm-hmm. has a sense of familiarity, but as you know, if you dig down, it's, it's doing some really interesting stuff that is pretty unique. Yeah. 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 And, and right. And, and that's, um, you know, being a humongous Beatles and Stevie wonder fan. Yeah. Um, one of the things I noticed about particularly Stevie wonder is that his melodies, his sense of melody was so amazing that it isn't until you have to sit down and go, Hey, you know what? Let me learn these chords. I'm going to learn this song. And then I'll sit down with one of his songs. Sometimes I'll think these, these chords are crazy. I never even took notice that yeah. this is like advanced jazz. You know, he's got unrelated chords in the same thing, but the melody is keeping, yeah. keeping it sounding like that's not happening. Uh, really brilliant. Um, so I think hopefully some of that pays off sometimes with me. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I think you brought up a good example. Yeah. That's the, that song. There's a, yeah, it, it sounds real familiar. And at the same time, there's a unique freshness about it. So, you know, it, it, it's, you kind of know that it's, you haven't heard it, but there's something about it that sounds familiar. Yeah. So on this topic of creativity, <clears throat> how, how do you, after all these years of playing and being in the music industry, how do you stay inspired and creative on the instrument? Another good question. You guys ask good questions. Um, this, this particular one, um, is pretty easy for me. And, and honestly, uh, it, I would, when I think about it, it's not, um, let me answer this from the back end. Um, I actually envy certain players out there who I won't mention any names, but have had, 
you know, pretty decent careers, essentially putting the same album out over and over again. Right. Um, I won't mention names, but, um, and I often think to myself, like, are you doing that? Because it's just, that's, you've just decided that this is your niche and, and you're, you're comfortable with owning that niche or are, is it lack of creativity or is it making sure I'd like, whatever it is, yeah. I kind of envy it because you're just comfortable doing that. Like me, I get literally in a bad mood. The moment I start to hear myself, the moment I start writing or composing something and it starts to remind me of something I've already done. Yeah. Uh, I was like, no, I, I have I so that. much, you know what I mean? Yep. It's got to be new territory. It has to feel fresh. So I think that's part of the reason why every one of my albums tends to have a little bit of a different feel to it. You know, mm-hmm. you may be able to tell that it's me every time, but, but one, one album will have sort of a jazzy feel. Another album will have more of a rock feel. Another album will have kind of a mellow feel or experimental feel. They all sort of have their little, sort of subtle theme about them. Yeah. And that's because I can't, I can't get inspired enough to even write unless I, unless the, unless the writing process is going to happen at least to some degree as part of the new uncharted territory. I, I need new things I haven't done at least as a, an, a, an element of that. Yeah. You probably in feel, order. In, yeah. Feel like you're pushing yourself or, or not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it could, and it it doesn't have to be pushing myself to to more complex things. It just has to be different. You know, it has to be new territory. Um, so that's how I stay. That's one of the things that keeps me inspired. And, um, and, and, you know, I'm inspired by great artists who have, who have come along before me that, you know, that have existed, you know, and I, and when I see this, their body of work, sometimes I like the Beatles and all these songs they've written. And so many of them are so like, how are they that creative? How did you just keep becoming creative? That inspires me when I hear, uh, I'll go back and listen to the white album or I'll listen to Sergeant Pepper or, or, you know, uh, Abbey road. And, and it's just like, man, do you guys ever run out of ideas? I know. Crazy. I mean, it just, it's just, it just keeps. So it makes, it reminds me that, the the uh the warehouse of ideas is uh is an infinite size yeah. it just there you, you know you, we just have to keep reminding ourselves yeah. just because we can, just because i may not be thinking of something doesn't mean that there's not something waiting to be discovered so if i'm having trouble writing it's not because i'm running out of things it's because i'm not accessing right uh you know that creative place yeah absolutely Definitely. that feels good you know, it feels good mm-hmm. to find something new in yourself. It does. Yeah. It really, really does. And I, I mean, honestly, that gets me more excited than, uh, you know, ripping guitar solos. <laughs> that, <laughs> I agree. That, to, to me, you know, gu- guitar solos, and this is why the instrumental world is always, even to this day, is a little, I still feel, I mean, I, you know, I like doing it. I, I, I like it, but um, I really come more from a song place. So, I never write songs around my guitar playing. A lot of times I'm just writing the stuff that I would want to hear. And then I have to figure out a way to make, you know, like the guitar playing for me is almost like a spice that's on top of the bulk of the cake. It's not really the song. It's, it, it's, it's the spice. Yeah. It's the extra, it's the topping, you know, it's right. an ingredient I would or li- an element. Right. I would like to think that if, if I break a string on stage and I need to walk off that, that the music that you're going to hear with the band is, st- is still cool. Yeah, you know still stands I mean? on I don't, its own, right? Still stands, right? Yeah. I don't want it to. I don't want it to be a guitar. And I'm not saying that it's. I'm a that, that there isn't a place for that. I look, you know, Steve Ray Vaughan's one of my favorite guitarists, yeah. and but the guitar is the whole band. You know, if he stops playing, <laughs> there yeah, is yeah, no yeah, songs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seven minutes of E. Yeah, good point. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I'm not saying I'm against that. No, right no. or e flat no it's case. great it's great but it's yeah i know what you mean my approach is just the, the other side of that yeah sure, sure absolutely so um kind of getting a little micro here maybe what mm. did your practice routines look like when you were coming up becoming the guitar player you are today and what do they mm-hmm. look like today how has how has that evolved 
Great question. Again, um, um, when I was younger, I never had a very regimented practice routine, never. And I never really took lessons. So um, a lot of times I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I just knew that I would hear things and have to, you know, experiment on the fretboard to try to figure out how, how the guy was doing. This is way before YouTube and the right. conveniences that these 12 year olds have today. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, in a certain way, I feel lucky though, because it, I think it was good to not know, not know the secrets because that, that's how you accidentally, you know, you have these happy accidents where you discover things in some totally unorthodox way and, and just to find out that, Oh, that's not how you do it. <laughs> But that's how I do it. So that's cool. Um, but anyway, my practice routine back then was was pretty much, honestly, of uh, figuring out Van Halen solos or Randy Rhodes solos or, or Yngwie mm -hmm. solos. And just um, if there was a section of the solo that required, like, for instance, you know, I remember when I first heard Yngwie and he would do those descending fours and ascending fours really fast. Yeah, picking every note, single like, string thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah single string thing yeah. and then there'd be one pl place where you could sort of shift to the next string right um and so that would be that was all like it, you know it, it's weird it, it, it wasn't difficult to figure it out but it was sometimes difficult to do it because it's like it was so precise and fast so i would think okay i'm going to learn the solo and now because of this one part that requires a technique that i haven't really developed yet i'll work on that section over and over again which is sort of like working so in other words if i were working on that section where he's going you know i'll probably do that 150 times and then in a certain way i've been working on alternate picking but i wasn't thinking right, of it that right, way right. yeah so all these you know, you know great players were your teachers yes those were my teachers and each and one of these songs are. were the master classes you know that's exactly right. That's yeah. a perfect way of yeah. putting it. You're, you're you're much better at this interview than I am because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. No way. No way. I don't think anyone but wants to hear me talk. They definitely want to hear you talk. <laughs> but that's a perfect way to put it, though. Um, and that's exactly what it was. So I would say now it's a little more regimented because now um, I've sort of there are certain things I've kind of decided about my playing. Um, like, for instance, I, I kind of grew tired of alternate picking. I never felt that comfortable with it. I never really felt like it was something that that um, that lent itself to my style. I never I actually got much better at it after I stopped doing it or, you know, I don't really do it that much. Once in a while, I'll, I'll do a little something. But, um, you know, like if you watch my instructional video from back in the back in the day, um, there's so there's all these warm up exercises that that involve alternate picking. I wasn't even that great at it. So it's like, wow, what am I doing here? Why, <laughs> what, what was I thinking? Um, and then I got better at it, but I sort of was never, um, when it comes to improvising, alternate picking is, is uh, I'm just using this one thing as an example. It was never something that felt like I could integrate it into, it never felt like I could implement that into my, playing in a natural way it's like if i'm going to go for this aldino demiola style run i'm going to have to focus on it so much that i that i sort of have to abandon uh right what you know, feels you or, right Just yeah i have I, I have to right i can't um, I, I almost have to remove myself from the music for a second mm -hmm. to make sure that the execution is right so it never felt connected it never felt like I could be thinking about what's going to happen next as I'm doing that. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I was never, I just kind of grew tired of the sound. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a big, sure. I, mean, I, I respect it when I hear it done really well. It's like, wow, that's really cool sounding, but for, for my music and for what I like, yeah, exactly. It was never, never really uh, worked. Right. It's all about I, your I just, taste. right. Exactly. Yeah. So, these days, my warm-up exercises really have to do with, um, like finger twister things. You know, you know, ascending and descending with like you know intervals of six or just you know okay, big cool. intervallic jumps and things that are not necessarily based on speed. I find that I actually warm up a lot better and quicker when I'm doing things that are technical but not necessarily you know, mind-boggling fast or anything right. um 
So yeah, I, I and and to some degree, it's still the same. I don't really have a regimented thing. I it's just there are certain warm ups that would be hard for me to explain in an interview that I will do that are mainly left hand oriented uh, and hybrid picking oriented. So mm-hmm. I didn't realize how much hybrid picking I do I do until I hurt my hand a few years ago, and I had to my right hand, and I had to wear a splint. Um because I actually broke my finger, um, wow. broke my second finger. And then I, I, I go to use the pick and I'm thinking, and it's like, wow, my second finger, really my right hand is technique is pretty much pick and second finger, hmm. right? About 50, 50. They're about, they equally are working as much yeah. together. And it took breaking your finger to, to kind of realize it, huh? When you yes, go back to I didn't. It, yeah. That's interesting. It was crazy. Yeah. I didn't realize it. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know I came to. And as a matter of fact, you know, when I recorded uh jumpstart way back in 93, I wasn't hybrid picking that much at all. Mm-hmm. In fact, I never, I didn't even know what it was until it, it, it was, it wasn't until like Michael Lee Ferkins came out and I started hearing him do all these amazing, like slide guitar sounds, you know, slide guitar player sounding licks and, these really cool slidey things and, and his, his approach is really cool. He was, I, I really dug him. And then Richie and I had Richie Cotson and I had recorded an album in like 94, or 95, mm-hmm. uh, the tilt album. Yeah. Right. We love that. And we, and we went to do a, a photo shoot together on the East coast because we hadn't seen each other when we recorded that with, it was completely remote. We never were in the same room together. So we finally hook up for a photo shoot. And he's got a guitar in his hand and he starts playing one of the songs. And he, and I notice he's using a lot of his second finger and he's doing a lot of hybrid picking. I'm like, mm-hmm. wow, I gotta, I better start doing this. You know, it seems like a lot of guys are doing this. This is when Brett Garson was coming out. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was like, I see Brett Garson, I see Michael E. Perkins, and now Richie's, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I gotta get my finger, I gotta get my fingers in there <laughs> and yeah. start doing stuff. So. Richie since took uh, it to the next level and threw yeah. the pick in the trash. <laughs> He did, and I don't know how the hell he did that. I just don't know how he Incredible. did that. Yeah, with with it no really with no real change in you know yeah ability. It, it seems no, it's completely unfair to the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's unfair for Richie to even exist with the amount of talent. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. No, he's he's amazing. But so anyway, um, I then started to just focus on any time that I would typically do like an upstroke in a, in a legato, in, in a left-hand oriented run, you know, this, mm-hmm. you know, you know how it is. You guys are both guitar players. I, yep. I take it. Yep. And so just because somebody is more of a left-hand player than an alternate picker, doesn't mean they're not picking. Right. You know, you, sometimes right. you're picking a lot. Um, so I just started to focus on making sure that every, everything that originally it was everything that I would typically use a, a, an upstroke for, I'm going to now use my second finger to pluck with. There you go. And now the strange thing is that I can't play the intro to jumpstart unless I do it hybrid picking. I don't know how I ever did it without doing that. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. <clears throat> That's super interesting. So something, a technique you didn't even know existed is now the only way you can play it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Um, this so, goes to show ab- adaptation to style and, and like just what you add to your playing all the time, you know, becomes yeah. you and you know? just general yes. evolution. Yeah. yeah, general evolution and just right. And and I really welcome that because I, yeah. I am the type of person that, that tends to get tired of hearing myself and mm-hmm. get tired of things. Uh, like I can't watch a movie when, when I see the previews and I can almost tell what the storyline, you know, yeah. it's Don't like even a typical American. Yeah. That. <laughs> That's a shame. Every, that every trailer now is the entire movie. Right. Or all the yeah, good parts. Exactly. It's like, all oh, the good it makes parts. it furious. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so I just tend to, I'm just a person that really gets off on unique and new, fresh things. I like yeah. to yeah. hear things that are different. Yeah. I think we all agree here uh, on that. That's, that's pretty awesome that we all feel that same way. And that definitely yeah, comes absolutely. through when you're playing, which, is, which I think is the most important part. That's cool. I mean, it's great to hear. I'm, I appreciate that. <laughs> but to answer your question, um, yeah. Uh, other than a few sort of warm up exercises, I don't really have a routine. Um, I will improvise a lot. A lot of times I'll just 
sit around and improvise. I, you know, the nice thing about YouTube is there's tons of backing tracks. So you can just find a, some cool backing tracks and, and just jam out for a while and practice cool phrases yeah, and totally things like that. But, um, yeah, my, my, everything that I do now that has to do with trying to expand as a player has more to do with, um, phrasing and, um, and the use of, of, of different scales or more sophisticated scales, addressing more sophisticated chords and things like that. So, um, I, I, I think as I don't, yeah, I don't really have a routine. Yeah. Okay. So the last couple questions here, as we wrap up, um, mm -hmm. what can we expect from you in the future? What can fans expect from you in the future? Uh, expect a, uh, finally this year, my instructional content will, will be out okay, in cool. v okay. various formats. So that's definitely happening. Um, I'm in this band protocol with Simon Phillips now. So that's, uh, that's fun. Um, so I sort of have two separate things that are always happening. So I've got my, my own thing, you know, in other words, I, for instance, I'm going on tour in Europe, um, to do my thing in October and November. Um, but we will have done a bunch of, uh, festivals and, and shows in the summer with Simon Phillips. Um, and then next year, or maybe the very, very end of this year, I want to start on a new album that I would, I, that, that will come out in 2019. Oh, cool. Awesome. And then my last question for you is, um, where can our audience find you? Well, um, Greg, com is a good start. <laughs> um, but I have, you know, and, and then from there you can access all the social media pages. So I've got, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and YouTube. Um, so should be fairly easy to find. I think if you, if you go to Facebook and type in my name, you'll, you'll probably find me. Um, but Greg, is where you can get all the, you know, you latest, certainly you'll, you'll get everything there. Cool. Everything you need cool. will be there. Got yeah. it. All right, Greg, thank you so much, man. We really, really appreciate it. Yes. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. And I think, um, man, I think everything you said is just going to be so valuable to our yes. listeners. And, and I'm stoked that you've come on the show and shared some of your knowledge. Very cool. Well, it's my pleasure. <laughs> All right, man. Until next time. Thank you, Greg. All right, you got it. Take care. Hey guys, first of all, thank you so much for listening. If you could please take a quick moment to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating and review, your feedback seriously is really important and it helps us keep the show alive. Check out musicianstalkshow.com to sign up for our mailing list. If you do, we're going to send you our main theme song and a few other surprises. Plus, you'll always be the first to know what episodes are coming up. If you want to help support the show so we can keep putting out the highest quality content possible, please follow the support the show link at our website and consider donating to our Patreon page. Lastly, if you have an idea for a guest or a question you want to discuss, contact us through any of the contact forms on our website and we'll do everything we can to make it happen. Whew, all right, that was a lot, but we got through it. Thanks again, guys, and we will see you soon. Yeah.